for those of you that might not know me, my name is Tom O'Mahony. Um, we're really the te Teach and Learning Unit. Um, we really appreciate, as always, your support and attendance at these sessions. We all recognize that you're busy and there are lots of other things that perhaps you uh, should be doing and could be doing. Uh, and um, do value, uh, as I said, your support and attendance here. So, um, I anticipated we'd start at about 10 past, so I'm a minute late, but we're close enough. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what um, the, the flipped classroom is. I'm then going to look at two different implementations, you know, Silwan here and uh, Jim, uh, oh sorry, he's over there. Um, I think coffee should be around then. Um, the Teaching with Technology, um, uh, Department of Te Teaching and Technology are running a EU funded project looking at flipped classrooms, so Dara is going to talk a little bit about that. Um, Shane is uh, going to talk about an implementation. Shane Cronin from the TEL department is going to talk about an implementation. Uh, I have one that I uh, piloted this semester. And through those implementations, hopefully you get a sense of the different ways in which you can go about um, looking at this. And then uh, if you have some questions we'll, um, uh, or, or thoughts, we'll look at those. So I guess uh, by way of a, uh, a kind of an introduction, if you're not kind of familiar with the concept, it would have, predomin uh, I guess, originated in the States where in lots of courses you have kind of lectures and then as part of the course is this kind of emphasis on homework and things like that. So in the, the, the notion in the traditional model uh, is that in class the lecturer introduces and explains concepts and then students are expected to you know, make sense of those through uh, independent learning by applying the concepts to homework problems and different things like that. Um, and the idea in the flipped classroom then is pretty much that we swap the order of um, these two things rather than working independently afterwards. Uh, the idea is that students would work independently before class and they do this bit themselves that they try and make some sense of the concepts that are important before they come to class. And then the in-class bit is about making sense and practicing and, and trying to um, learn the concepts. So the stuff that would traditionally have been done uh, independently at home is then done in the classroom with the support of the lecturer and, and things like that. So I guess very simply that's the notion of the flip that we're kind of swapping, if you like, the order of these two things that independently they're um, uh, being introduced to the topic uh, themselves, or they're introducing themselves to the topic themselves, and then um, uh, the classwork is about more active things around trying to make sense of um, some of the ideas. Um, could you take a minute, uh, this I created before I left, which explains why I forgot the E and my son. Um, can, could you list some limitations of the tradi traditional lecturing module uh, model? Um, so maybe if you take a moment yourselves and think maybe independently, what are the sorts of limitations associated with that or might be associated with that? Uh, and maybe jot down a few of those and then maybe in the tables that you are at, is there some commonality between you know, the, the, the limitations that you might associate with the traditional lecturing model uh, and see maybe the ways in which you um, agree or differ. Does that make sense, what I'm asking you to do? Okay, so um, within, within your groups, do you have any kind of common issues or things that two or three people came up with? Engagement. Engagement. Okay. 
Uh, so, so the traditional lecturing module, model would be criticized because it's very passive for the students. There are issues around engagement. Uh, and obviously, if students aren't engaged, then there's going to be real questions about what they're learning uh, or if they're learning anything. Very good. Any, any other any common things that you'd have come up with? Uh, I think we came up, what I had done, I think it came up as well, wasting time because some students know a lot and have to sit through stuff that's boring and others are at a different level. Mm -hmm. Very good. struggling to catch up. So I think Perfect. I, catch, I had that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the other one was unknown unknowns. They don't always know what they don't know until they try it out. Um, yes, and, and one of the, I guess one of the issues th that I would see with the, if we go back with this model, the traditional one, so they take home this homework, what happens if they can't start it? So what do they do? How do they make sense if they have a responsible if they have a responsibility to do this themselves and they don't even know where to start, you know, because of how the thing is pitched or because of their lack of understanding? You know, where is the support going to come from? How are they going to work through this? And, and you know, there's a lot of maybe onus or responsibility on them. And if it doesn't if, if they can make sense of it then uh, there isn't maybe a lot of support and Again, the argument would be that this is where the real learning happens, uh, and maybe there should be more support there. So, um, some of the arguments for, for flipped classroom, it's it, the notion that it supports active and collaborative learning. So often in the classroom, in the flip model, uh, what, what they're doing is they're discussing things, they're solving problems in groups, like you've had a very short um, uh, uh, thing at, and, and through that, there is support so they can ask their peers, look, I don't know what to do or I'm stuck in this place. And, and that can you know, help them to move along. And obviously the lecturer is there as well in order to, to give support and feedback and things like that. Uh, the argument would be the real, hap the real learning happens in the doing and having support for that is useful. Um, higher education talks a lot about independent and lifelong learning and is often criticized for not doing an awful lot about independent and lifelong learning, that we're holding students' hands, that we're telling them everything, that we're giving them all the resources and stuff like that. And one of the arguments with the flipped classroom or, or in support of the flipped classroom is there is a requirement to do some independent learning before you come to class. Okay, we might give you the resources and things, but you need to go and make sense of them yourself before you come to class, which is kind of developing this um, skill. Um, the last one, um, Killian, you mentioned the, no the notion of diversity, that you might have learners with different abilities. You know, some can learn very quite quickly and some are much slower. Uh, and giving them material beforehand allows them to pace themselves. So, it, you know, if they know the stuff, they can fly through it. Uh, and if they don't, then they can, you know, take it easier. And it gives them some choice and control so they can do it in their own time and at their own pace so that they're, you know, not dictated by my pace and flying through the course or whatever. So there are um, some of those arguments uh, in support of the flipped classroom. And did I miss? No. Um, there's a definition which we've kind of um, um, talked about. It's a reversal of the traditional teaching where students gain exposure to new material outside of class, usually via reading or lecture videos. And then class time is used to do the harder work of assimilating that knowledge to strategies such as problem-based uh, solving or uh, problem-solving or discussion or debates. Um, and for me, this latter part of it is the, is the key bit. It's not about providing more content. It's about how we use the class time. It's about that shift in what happens in the class, that the class moves from being exclusively a lecture or predominantly a lecture to predominantly about something else. Uh, and, and I think if we don't, if, if I, I guess for me at least, if that's not the core reason why you're doing f the flipped classroom, then it's probably not going to work for you because that's what it's about. Um, and like a lot of things, there is a continuum sort of in it that we can have the pure flipped classroom where all of the content is kind of shipped beforehand and learners are expected you know, to make sense of all of the content independently, and then all of the class is about problem solving and activities and things like that, to a sort of much, you know, maybe uh, more 
uh, argued definition of a flipped classroom, which might often be called a blended learning environment, or more correctly, but where some of the content is provided um, prior to class, and then the in-class can have a mixture of things. So there can still be lectures. There are components of lectures, but students are doing more than you know, just sitting and listening. So um, while I guess this would be kind of the purest definition of what a flipped classroom is about, um, lots of practice is shifting towards this direction where there's a much, much more of a mix. So I guess in terms of, you know, maybe making sense of it, don't imagine that everything has to be, you know, um, front shifted or shifted prior to the, the class. Um, and in terms of me making sense of it myself, I was looking at some resources, the flip in the college classroom, practical advice, and, and in, in that, Barbie is talking about the same thing. Don't flip everything. If a lesson is working well and students are meeting or exce exceeding expectations, then leave it alone. What's the point in doing it, you know, of changing that if it's working well for you? Uh, look, look for points in your course or in your classes where your students are bored, where they're confused, where as a lecturer you are bored with delivering the material. And then, well, here's an opportunity to do something different, to do something better. And, and, and focus, especially at the start, if this is something that you're thinking of exploring and thinking of doing, there is a challenge in terms of setting it up and getting it working and stuff, and it makes sense to focus on where you're going to get the most dividend initially, which is, you know, the tricky parts or the hard parts and stuff, for places where students are likely to be confused. Um, challenges. What do you imagine is going to stop this from working? <laughs> students not turning up, okay? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, there are, there are concerns around students not turning up. Um, my experience is that if students see value, get value from turning up, they'll turn up. Like, so where they won't turn up is, I've got all the course notes and the lecturer is just reading them out to me anyhow, so why would I bother turning up? But if the lecturer or if the class is doing something which is helping them come to a better understanding of those course notes so that they see that they're likely to do better in assessments or exams, they will be here because they get the benefit. Now, they might need to be enticed initially and stuff like that, so you might need. But so that's, that's my experience. It depends an awful lot. But, but you are right, there are concerns about students not turning up. What about if they turn up but they haven't done the reading before they? Yeah. Yeah, if they, if they turn up and they have, and again, that's the other big concern is students won't read the stuff beforehand. And then again, it's a very legitimate concern. I have a slide there which I'm going to talk about some strategies that we can use for that. The, 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 the consistent piece of advice I've seen is don't start lecturing it. Because as soon as you start doing that, you've lost the flipped classroom as a concept. That they will all recognize that you're just going to lecture me anyhow. So I don't need to read the resources, and, and therefore, uh, uh, and, and therefore I won't. So, um, insofar as you can, you're going to try and resist lecturing the content that you've put up there, unless when you look at it, it's obvious that they don't get it at all, and you need to, you know, develop it further because they just completely misunderstood what you know, was there. How do you appropriately assess them? Mm -hmm. How do you appropriately assess? whether they've understood. Yeah. So what I would have done is so have some content and before they come to class they need to answer some short questions. And is that part of formative assessment? Or uh, I would have given like 10% for answering those questions. I showed it at the end like 90% of the class engaged with the answered questions and looked at the materials. Um, but, but you probably, you, you certainly at the start probably need to incentivize them in some way by giving them some credit towards the activity. I wonder what the question, how do you assess it at the end? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Assess at the end is the same. It's the same course. Like it's the same learning outcomes. It's the same skills that I'm expecting. It's just that I'm delivering it in a different way. So I don't say it can still be assessed through exams. It can still be assessed through CA. Whatever you're doing, in my view, doesn't need to radically change because you haven't changed your learning outcomes or any of those sorts of things. So. All of that can still be in situ. It's really just about uh, developing a better understanding, developing students' understanding of the material so that they have a better or a deeper understanding of, of the thing. So I, I don't see that you, you need to change 
you know, the main assessment methods that you're using within your course. Sure. Um, I'd see class size as being a limitation. Mm. A smaller group leads to easier discussion. Take a large group in IT3 and yeah. you've got a different dynamic. You certainly have and, and, and there are there are challenges around that. And yes, I absolutely agree. It's much it's it's not just easier, it's much more comfortable for you for me as a lecturer to do with a group this size than to go into two hundred machines and try and do it. I don't have two machines, I never have, so I can't say personally but the but I've read and suggest that it does work in larger groups as well. But I do think there are other issues to confidence and, and, and the environment that they're in and stuff. But the principle apparently applies. I think there's an element of the less supervised, or the, you know, even in a large room, the distance from the lecturer and yeah. the people into a group discussion and they're talking about what they did last night as opposed yeah, to yeah. what they're meant to be talking about. You know? Yeah, and, and there, are, there are ways that we can try and, and, and manage that by you know, um, yeah, there are ways we can try and manage that, which yes, it is de definitely more difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even our tiered classrooms maybe don't lend themselves as well as a room like this. Yeah, yeah you can still kind of, like I would have done it with a group of like 60 students in a tier classroom, you kind of get the two behind and the two in front to sort of turn around and make a pair of four, and, and it can work, but yes, it's a lot more, but then it's not as, as, as conducive. But um, yeah, you, you still can, your students kind of re react not negatively in the sense that like you're possibly, you know, every other lecturer stands up in lectures and mm. all of a sudden then you're going, that's here. And yeah, this. and and they just recognise I'm a bit mad and stuff and <laughs> it's fine. Um, you need to tell them why you're doing it. Right. You, you need, need to uh, explain the classroom approach to them. Yeah. You, you need to convince them that this yeah. is a worthwhile endeavour, not for me, for, for them. Yeah. What's in it for them? And that has to happen, so like for me, the first class, the first group, the first time I meet them, they're doing activities, they're involved in discussions, and, and the discussions are around why this is a useful thing to be doing. And, and you're, you know, you're outlining why, and particularly it's from their perspective, what's in it for them? And you know, there's evidence there that active learning needs to increase grades to better understanding. And you can pull in some of those things, or, or even from a you know, personal perspective, you can talk to them about, well, how do you learn? You know? think of as something that you're good at and how did you develop that as a competency and it's through doing things and practice and all those sorts of things and they kind of go, oh, actually that makes some sense. You know, you didn't learn that, you didn't get good at football by sitting and watching, watching someone or listening even worse again to someone explain how to kick the football. You know, you went off and you did it or, or whatever the context might be. Um, so if I've talked, uh, I've kind of touched on all these. Um, so in terms of the engagement, we do need to explain what we're doing, we need to prepare students for their role. Uh, I think assigning marks is useful, particularly at the start of the process. Uh, and I think the learning, they need to see that it's meaningful, that it has a purpose of so the stuff that's going on in class. And I think once you get them engaged at the start, they see that it's meaningful, they see that it's having an impact on their learning, uh, you know, they're more likely, you're going to get less resistance. And you also need to be aware of what you're asking them to do outside. So if we're flipping this and we're saying that you need to read these, you know, 50 pages before the next class, they're going, well, I don't have time to read 50 pages, so I'm not just going to do it. So it has to be reasonable what you're asking them to do. And I, I think that's a tricky thing to figure out. It can be a tricky thing to figure out. And it's not just the volume, but it's also the difficulty. So like if we're asking them to make sense of quite tricky concepts by themselves, maybe that's not what we should be doing. Maybe we should be asking them to make sense of the easier parts of the course. You know, the course, the bits that can be easily understood by reading something uh, and focus on those rather than, and, and in class, focus on the trickier bits, the stuff that you know they, they struggle with. Uh, and it's you know, maybe about um, uh, thinking some of those. And, and I don't have a lot of evidence uh, around this, and maybe Dara and the guys might have more about text versus video. My own intuition is that probably video is a little bit more engaging than text. So if we create you know, resources based around video, maybe you're more likely to get engagement and lots of the kind of flipped classroom stuff are using videos rather than text-based offers. That's not to say that 
you know, it has to be that way or anything like that. But when I see people writing about it and talking about it, they're often talking about video as the resource that students are looking at rather than text-based documents. And, and I wonder whether that's to do with the engagement piece. Yeah. 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 Yeah.